Hello everyone, I um, hope you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is James Mann and along with my colleague Zave Pepan, we will be presenting to you today on the biopharmaceutics classification system based biowaivers, uh, which was harmonized back in the end of 2019 uh, as ICH-M9. Um, this is an uh, overview of our talk today. Um, we will be go through a little bit of an introduction on the guideline, the background and objective and the scope of the guideline. Then we'll focus on how you classify uh, a drug substance, and that is via the solubility and the permeability of the drug substance. But in order to access the biowaivers, you need to show the eligibility of the drug product for the biowaiver, and that's uh, focusing on the excipients and the in vitro dissolution. Uh, and then we'll cover the documentation. So I'll be taking you through um, the solubility and the in vitro dissolution in the introduction, and my colleague Xavi will be handling permeability and excipients. So this is a, a slide um, which I tried to use to outline the need for harmonization. So this is the situation before ICHM9 came along, and it's, and it's courtesy of my uh, colleague Abvi Zhishao. And this uh, shows the differences between different territories across the world um, before ICHM9. And you will notice that if you look at this table in detail, and it is hard to see, see all the detail, but there are uh, differences in which countries accepted both BCS1 and 3, or just some, one in the case of Brazil and Russia, you can see. There are differences in the apparatus used for the in vitro dissolution part uh, and the paddle speeds that you were allowed. There is differences in the volumes. There is some subtle differences in the media and the way that you comprise similarity. And, and also um, uh, there was countries like Japan, which had no formal guideline for BCS biowaivers. So, as a as an industry as an industrial perspective, which is where me, myself and Zave look at this from, is we would have to do different uh, packages of work for different territories in order to satisfy those different requirements. And obviously, that's a, not a very um, uh, efficient way to do business. And so when we, when, when ICHM9 came along with this harmonization, it's obviously a great benefit to industry because it means that in theory, we only need to do one package for a BCS biowaiver um, for uh, a, global, um, a global file. So a little bit of background. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the BCS-based uh, uh, biowaiver approach is based on a, a simple risk-based classification that Gordon Amidon uh, published uh, with others back in 1995. So the first thing to really note is it took 25 years to harmonize on this. Um, and we kind of hope that um, future biopharmaceutic improvements, such as things like physiological-based biopharmaceutic modeling, won't take 25 years to reach a harmonized position. But for those of you who don't know, the, you, have, you, you classify your drug substances based on solubility and permeability, with the low risk categories being BCS1 and 3. So those are the high solubility ones. So high solubility, high permeability, BCS class 1. Class 3, high solubility, low permeability. And then you have the others which are not part of the ICHM9 guidelines, which is class 2, which is low solubility, high permeability, and class 4, often the worst from a development perspective, low solubility, low permeability. And really, the idea of the BCS biowaivers is that we can use the in vitro data to, uh, as a surrogate for in vivo bioequivalent bio studies. And so that's a good thing because it means that we can reduce dosing of medicines to healthy volunteers. Um, it's a scientific approach, it's a risk-based approach, and that is why uh, we in industry, we, we like it. So the scope of it, um, well, obviously, it's used to substantiate in vivo bioequivalence. And times that it might be used, uh, the BCS biowaver might be used, well, we might have be comparing products that were used in early clinical development to the final product that we would like to commercialize. That is obviously, from our perspective as an innovator, that is our key consideration here. Um, also, you can uh, conduct post-approval changes, you know, things like where you would uh, be asked to change um, to perform a bioequivalent study, you can probably uh, uh, substitute that with the uh, BCS bio, BCS-based biowaver. And obviously, it's applicable for generic drug products, and, and, and that uh, is often one of the, the large focus areas of it. There are limitations to it. It's only applicable for immediate release, solid oral dosage forms, or suspensions, designed to deliver drug to systemic circulation. Um, it's applicable to drugs with nonlinear PK, 
that's important to say. Um, it, however, locally acting drug products are excluded. So anything which is designed to act in, inside the GI tract and not be absorbed, that, that would be excluded. Narrow therapeutic index drug products are excluded. Um, fixed dose combination products will be eligible, but only if all drug substances meet the criteria, as as in they have to contain basically BCS1 or 3 drug substances. If you have a mixture of, say, 1 and class 2, then you would not be able to access a BCS-based bioweaver. Um, any products with buccal or sublingual absorption, they are not eligible. And only products which are administered with water are eligible. So if you have designed an oral dispersible product they, that is to be dosed without water, then a bioequivalent study would be required. So like I said at the start, this is uh, for high solubility guidance uh, products, uh, drug, drug substances um, which contain drug products with, uh, which contain drug substances with BCS class one. Um, so that will be BCS1 and BCS3. It is important that the drug substance in the test and reference product must be identical. Okay, The drug product must be the same strength and the dosage form as reference. So that means you cannot go from a tablet to a capsule first per se, uh, at least on the strictest interpretation of the guidance. Again, you could attempt a science-based approach for that. The BioWaver may be applicable if the test and reference products can uh, contain different salts, provided they both belong to BCS class one. So that, that is a, a possibility. Um, however, you cannot have a biowaver when they contain a different ester, an ether, an isomer, or a mixture of isomers, complex or derivative of the drug substance from that of the reference product. So, so really the only leeway here is when it's a, a, a salt of the same drug substance uh, a different salt of the same drug substance that you can access it. But otherwise, the APIs must be identical. Uh, and this is due to the differences that may lead to bioavailables that are not deducible by experiments defined in the ICH-M9 uh, based bioweaver. Um, prodrugs can be considered, but only when they're absorbed as the prodrug. So if they undergo any kind of hydrolysis or any oxidation or any change during the um, uh, time in the GI tract, then they, they cannot be considered. It's only if they're absorbed as the prodrug. So we'll move on now to uh, the first topic that it's the part of the classification, which is solubility. And this is an area where during the ICHM9 um, uh, process, uh, harmonization process, there was actually quite a lot of debate. And it was a lot of debate as to whether you needed to classify it based on highest single therapeutic dose or highest strength. And if you look back across the guidances from the different territories, and I, I've highlighted the FDA, EMA, WHO, and Canada, you can see there was a difference here. The FDA's position was highest formulation strength, whereas the rest of the ones on the slide were highest single therapeutic dose. The FDA's position for this, I believe, was related to the fact that when you conduct a bioequivalent study, you perform it on a single highest strength to show that the products are equivalent, whereas the rest of the world um, was looking at it as in the dose that the patient will see. So what they settled on after much debate was they settled on the highest single therapeutic dose has to be completely soluble in 250 mils or less of aqueous media over the range of pH uh, 1.2 to 6.8 at 37 degrees. However, they did give uh, what, what I would call a get out of jail free card, uh, which is in the cases where your highest single therapeutic dose does not meet the criteria, but the highest strength of the reference product would be soluble under the aforementioned conditions, you can submit additional data to justify your BCS based bioweaver approach. And later on in the guidance, when it's talking about its eligibility, it does discuss the use of dose proportional PK over your dose range that includes that highest single therapeutic dose as supporting evidence that you would be in the, in the case. There, there aren't many cases that will do this because you would have to imagine that say you had a 10 meg strength but you were dosing a 20 meg dose, that that would straddle that change from being soluble to not soluble in that 250 ml volume. Okay, so we move on. So some detail, uh, details that you have to provide um, for your solubility experiment. It must be at three pHs, including uh, the buffers at 1.2, 4.5, and 6.8. These are the common uh, solubility and dissolution buffers. 
Um, you also have to evaluate the solubility at the pH which is lowest. Now normally, say for a weak base, that would be pH 6.8 and you would be probably done. For a weak acid, it would be 1.2. Um, however, if you have a zwitter ion, then that minima solubility could be anywhere in between. So you would need to uh, do some solubility predictions based on pKa uh, and um, I'd establish where that lowest solubility would be. They expect you to do the solubility experiment uh, over and it should be shown to be maintained over a relevant time frame to accommodate the expected duration of absorption. So sort of probably over about four to five to six hours. The uh, solubility uh, would be performed using a sort of traditional shake flask method, but it does the guidance does allow you to do alternative methods if justified. Um, so, for instance, you might use so small, smaller volumes of solubility media than you would in a shake flask experiment, and, and this is the AZ approach. We would typically carry out these experiments um, in uh, small Eppendorf tubes on a, on a thermal shaker. Um, we do this to preserve API because quite often when we're measuring solubility, we may not have that much of the drug substance because we could be quite early in development. Um, the next point is an important one, but the pH should be measured after addition of the drug substance and at the end of the experiment. Uh, and it is important in the case of a BCS biowaver that you adjust the pH if after addition of your drug substance, it uh, deviates from the expected value. Uh, and that's slightly different from how you might normally perform um, uh, solubilities because quite often you're interested in knowing what the pH drifts to when you um, when you add your API, but in the case of a bio waiver, you have to bring it back to those fixed pH values. Um, and it's not in the guidance mentioned, but it is actually best practice for solubility measurements to confirm the the, the form to make sure that you haven't had uh, any form change, or at least to understand the form that you've measured the solubility of at the end of the experiment. Um, and you need a time frame um, to uh, reach the equilibrium. Um, at AZ, we typically will do that for 24 hours, although I have had a cases where we've needed to go much longer than that to reach the equilibrium solubility. Uh, and in the cases where you have issues measuring um, an equilibrium solubility, and, and that could be when the drug is so highly soluble that it just keeps on dissolving, or maybe it self buffers um, uh, when it's present in an excess, the guidance has given you an opportunity to do an alternative measurement, which is where you would take the highest therapeutic single dose and you just prove that it will dissolve in a 250 mil volume or proportionally smaller amount. Um, in a proportionally smaller volume of media can be considered. And, and that's a nice little extra way, you know, if you have a weak base at pH 1.2, you know, sometimes these things are, you know, greater than 100 megamil soluble and, and it will just keep on consuming drug. And it, and, and it is important to say that the lowest measured solubility will be used to classify the drug substance. So again, that's quite ov ov obvious for a weak base or a weak acid as to which one you will use, but you have to show it across all three. Um, we would always do a minimum of three replicates at each solubility uh, and each pH using the appropriate compendial media. It doesn't specify which compendia to use, um, so that's really um, the, uh, the, the person who's submitting the bioweaver's choice. Uh, we recommend USP buffers as these are the most commonly used in the dissolution method development, so normally we will have the most information in those buffers. Uh, you use the mean of the replicates to make the determination. Uh, and there is a, a, a note in, I think it's the Q&A document, which it says that high variability is really not expected for a highly soluble drug substance. So you, you, you really should have low variability in your measurements. You must use a suitably validated method. Um, and we would recommend that you use the method that you've used for your assay degradation, as that should be stability indicating. Because the next point that they make is that adequate stability in the solubility media must be demonstrated. And it also states in cases where more than 10% degradation is observed over the course of the assessment, then you cannot classify the drug due to being able to unable to adequately determine the solubility. There is an option to provide the, uh, provided in the guidance to use the literature data uh, to substantiate and support solubility determinations. Um, it is important to note that this is a, seen as an addition to experimental data, but not as a substitute. Um, and it, they do caution, I think again in the Q&A document, that the journal articles may not contain the necessary detail level needed to make the judgment on the quality of the solubility studies. So now I'll hand over to Zavi, who will talk to you about permeability, and I will quickly put myself James. on.
Thanks, James. So in order to determine the high permeability of a, of a drug substance, you have three potential ways of achieving that. Either you have a human absolute bioavailability studies, which demonstrates that your um, bioavailability is over 85%. That's the first option. The second option is for you to run a mass balance study with a label compound. And if you can recover in the urine um, the more than 85% of the total unchanged drug phase one oxidative metabolites and phase two conjugated metabolites, this would uh, qualify for um, highly permeable as well. If you're only looking at the thesis for the um, mass balance studies, you cannot count the unchanged drug. So you can look at the phase one and phase two metabolites. Um, and in no cases, um, post absorption, can you um, can you look at the hydrolysis uh, metabolite or the metabolite which were produced by reduction, because that uh, could could happen uh, in uh, before absorption. So if you um, if you are to count the drug in the feces, you need to demonstrate that this was secreted. So if you have uh, enterohepatic circulation. For instance, or if you have a, a phase two metabolite that is deconjugated, that can that can be counted. But you need to provide additional information, and that's usually uh, quite hard to get in human. The third way to demonstrate a high a high permeability for your drug is to look at in vitro assessment in CACO2 cell lines, um, and in this case, you need also to demonstrate that your drug is stable in the GI tract. So, same similar as for the solubility, you need to have less than 10% degradation over the course of the measurement. The next slide, James. So a little bit more on the CACO2 cell line. So the guideline says that this approach is limited to uh, passively transported drugs, so you, you should not have um, relevant efflux. And they set the, the threshold for an efflux of two. So the efflux is the ratio between um, basal to apical and apical to basal probability. So this should be less than two. You also have to demonstrate looking at the electrical resistance of your cell line that it is not damaged. So you're looking at the uh, uh, TER and and show that the, the, the tight junctions are, are, are working. Um, you need a suitable number of reference compounds and they give you a table in the next slide. You'll see there's a table with a reference compound. This is used to establish a correlation, but also to do direct comparison with a high permeability reference. And this is how you will um, demonstrate that your drug is a high permeability drug. So to evaluate the efflux, you can vary the concentration if you have a, a concentration dependent permeability. And you, you can look at 1%, 10% of the uh, highest drug strength dissolved in, in the 250 mL. Um, and also the, the, the highest drug strength itself. So you, you would vary the concentration to look at the impact of, con of, um, of efflux. Um, you need to have a good recovery. So the mass balance of these uh, studies has to be above 80%. And if you don't have that, you need to investigate it and to evaluate the impact on your, on your measurement. So as I mentioned before, you will classify your drug as highly permeable if it's higher or equal um, to one of the high probability markers that you have chosen. So next slide, you have a table in the guideline which gives you the highly permeable drugs. And you need to pick um, one of them at least uh, and, and five in total uh, in that list to, to establish your correlation. I also gave uh, published data from Leninas. So these are the actual probability values that are measured in human. We've got two papers here if you want to, to look further and establish your correlation. Next slide. So some questions were, um, uh, were of interest during the, the review of this guideline. So the first question is, why do we only use CACO2? Because there's more than CACO2 cell lines, MDCK and others. And it's true that the, um, the, uh, the the guideline focuses on CAC2 just because this is the, the, the cell line that has most um, background, where most background information is available, where that uh, regulators are most familiar with. But in the future, uh, the guideline also says that when uh, they gain confidence in new models, they could add them. So there may be variations or amendments to, to these guidelines or revisions.
to include um, future cell lines. So um, the other question was around moderate permeability. Does it help to be moderate permeability? And the answer is no. The BCS is a binary classification, so only high permeability marker is needed. If you're moderate permeability, it will be considered as low as per the BCS classification. So it does not help um, to be moderate. Next slide. An important aspect, as uh, James mentioned, for the applicability of the, of the guideline is the suitability of your uh, drug product. And so in the, in the, when you waive a human evaluation between a reference and a test, you need to make sure that both formulations are similar. And uh, for a BCS class 1, this is defined by uh, the fact that the sum of all the excipients which may affect absorption should not vary. Uh, by more than 10% between the test and the reference. Um, so these excipients are typical um, of, for instance, uh, drugs that are uh, excipients that can impact the transit time, like mannitol, uh, sorbitol, so all the uh, un, uh, poorly digestible um, polysaccharides, uh, PEG, uh, polyethylene glycol, uh, when the molecular weight is, is higher than 400, stays in the, in the lumen of the GI tract and with osmotic pressure, also uh, creates an acceleration. So these exceptions are, um, the changes in these exceptions is controlled. So for BCS class 1, 10% maximum difference. Next slide. For BCS class 3, uh, these exceptions are much more uh, scrutinized because, of course, being a poorly permeable drug, you, will, um, you may have an absorption window, and if you miss it because you have a high transit time, then this would uh, uh, diminish your, your bioavailability and that cannot be measured by dissolution or solubility. So for, for the BCS class 3 drugs, the um, in addition to the not more than 10% for uh, uh, the individual or the sum of the excipients that may affect absorption, you also have some more restricted values for different types of excipients and you have it in the table here. I'm not going through all of these details. Um, but in addition to these uh, quantitative difference you also need to be qualitatively similar so you need to have for those excipients um, which may affect absorption you, you need to have a qualitative and quantitative um, similarity so i mentioned transit time there's also excipients that may affect solubility so um, like surfactants or um, or, or co-solvents these these are also um, uh, so excipients that you have to pay attention to when you evaluate uh, by waiver um, based um, um, the, the ICHN9 uh, applicability to drug products. So next slide. So in terms of questions on the excipients uh, for fixed dose combinations, if all the um, drugs, the two drugs or three drugs are BCS class 1, then you, you would uh, apply the criteria for the excipients of BCS class 1. If one of the drugs is BCS class 3 or all of them, BCS class 3, then the criteria for BCS class 3 excipients would apply. Um, you cannot do, you cannot bridge, as, as uh, James mentioned, different formulations of the same drug, but you could use the principle of this guideline to interact with regulators and, and have a science-based approach. Um, Physiological-based biopharmaceutics models can be used uh, to support changes beyond those recommended only if uh, the mechanism of action is understood and, and the PBBM was, was validated on, on this mechanism of action. And finally, if you need to do changes beyond those recommended for the excipients, then you have to generate human data to demonstrate that there's no impact on, on the exposure. Next slide. It's you again. Thank you, Xavi. Um, and now we're going to just cover um, the other part of the drug product from the excipients, which is the in vitro dissolution. And there were two major debates during ICHM9, and they were both they were whether they would include water and whether to allow 75 rpm when coning is observed. Uh, and I'm pleased to say, well, water wasn't included. Um, in personal opinion, I don't believe water adds very much. It's also a media which is variable across laboratories um, and, and difficult to control. Um, compared to, say, a buffer. Uh, however, 75 RPM wasn't uh, specifically specified, um, and we'll come on to that in a little more detail, what was actually specified when you observe coning. 
But in order to do your uh, comparative dissolution, you need to conduct it on one batch, uh, which is representative of the proposed commercial manufacturing process for the test product relative to the reference product. I mean, one batch in itself is quite interesting. You, you could argue that um, you should have to look across uh, multiple batches. Um, it depends how variable your manufacturing process is, although for a highly soluble drug, you wouldn't expect the dissolution to be particularly variable. Uh, the test product should originate from a batch that's at least one-tenth production scale or 100,000 units, whichever is greater, unless you can justify otherwise. Um, there is a comment around clinical phases, which again is our, our maybe our area of focus, where smaller batch sizes may be acceptable if justified. Again, if you're making that switch from, say, an early phase one formulation to a, to a phase 2B or a phase 3 formulation, then it might be that that um, reference batch hasn't been produced at uh, any kind of scale, for example. The compendial apparatus uh, should be used, and you should also use suitably validated analytical methods. That's a, that's also a given. Um, okay. Uh, the conditions uh, which you can use, you can use paddle or basket apparatus. You have to use 900 mil or less. So again, they harmonized this volume, uh, but gave you the opportunity to use less than 900 if you wanted. And they also commented that you should use the volume of the QC method um, as well. So that, that was an important addition. The temperature is 37 degrees plus or minus one, which is actually wider than most pharmacopoeia requirements and most specifications of baths. The two speeds that you're allowed are you're allowed 50 RPM for your paddle apparatus or 100 RPM for your basket. Um, you have to use at least 12 units of both test and reference. That's pretty standard. You use the three buffers and also a minimum solubility if you again have that zwitter ion um, situation. You're not allowed any organic solvents and you're not allowed any surfactants to be added to your dissolution media for a, um, for this. Obviously, it's a high solubility classification and so therefore you shouldn't need anything to improve solubilization in your dissolution test. Samples must be filtered immediately after collection. That's just best practice for dissolution unless you're using in situ analysis such as fiber optics. Uh, and also they do give you the opportunity if you're using gelatin capsules in your biowaver, then if you can demonstrate cross-linking, the use of enzymes may be acceptable if justified. Now, I wouldn't imagine this will ever be needed because in my mind, most people would do um, uh, their biowaver with fresh capsules, which is um, would not be cross-linked, because um, cross-linking tends to happen on stability. But I guess in the uh, case of a generic, maybe when they're obtaining the reference product, it might be that they cannot obtain fresh products. So they, they, they do give themselves that opportunity. Uh, if we move on, um, we talk a little bit about coning. So coning is obviously when you get this uh, pile of material um, and my slide here, you can see at the top right hand corner uh, for 50 RPM, you can see a pile of material that is not present at 75 in the second photo. And then in 100 RPM basket, you can see again, there is sometimes the presence of coning in there. Um, the picture below corresponds to this, where you can see in coning, um, after 30 minutes, we do what's called an infinity spin and we turn the paddle speeds up high and you can see that you were able to break up that cone and recover the drug substance. You don't see the cone at 75 and in this case, you don't see it in the basket either. Um, so we as an industry would have liked to have seen 75 RPM explicitly stated. It was already stated in some of the guidances like the FDAs because it tends to be um, used when you see coning, which is this pile of material, and it tends to arrive when we have highly dense excipients like dicalcium phosphate. Um, and that um, th those are excipients that formulators like to use for manufacturability, tablability reasons, um, and we would like to have been able to overcome them because essentially they are in vitro artifacts. So what the guidance currently says is when high variability or coning is observed in the paddle apparatus at 50 RPM for both reference and test, the use of basket at 100 RPM is recommended. Now that, that will work in, in the example on, on this slide, that, that does work. However, we do have examples in our company where that hasn't worked. So then the, the text goes on to state, additionally, alternative methods, e.g. the use of sinkers or other appropriately justified approaches may be considered to overcome issues such as coning if scientifically substantiated. All experimental results should be provided. So in our case, like I said, baskets don't often improve the situation. 
Um, sinkers, which is the one that's explicitly exemplified in the text, has there's no evidence of that improving coning, at least to my experience. And actually, Jennifer Dressman published a paper in Dissolution Technologies last month, which basically proved that it didn't help. Normally, the strategies that will work to improve coning are 75 RPM paddle or use of the apex peak vessel neither of which are explicitly called out in the guidance. And I think you could probably make a scientific argument for including them, but the question would then arise, would this be a, um, approved globally? We know from the feedback we got from the working party, the, the ICH working group, that there was a split of opinion on this and that some territories would be prepared to take 75 RPM or an alternative, whereas other countries may not be so keen. And so it does call into question the global acceptability if you see coning. Um, if we move on. Um, so the criteria for uh, acceptability, so for BCS1, both test and reference should display either very rapid or rapid. Um, and that's uh, for, for very rapid, that's greater than 85%, dissolved in less than or equal to 15, and rapid is greater than 85, um, dissolved in less than or equal to 30 minutes. And they should have similar uh, in vitro dissolution characteristics. And this should be done under all of the defined pH conditions. So when you need to compare those, uh, so for instance, when one product has rapid and one has very rapid, the similarity should be demonstrated, and that is done using F2, which is a classical test, it's well, well established in the industry. In order for the F2 to be satisfied, you must use a minimum of three time points uh, with excluding zero. You have to match the time points for both products. You compare the means. This is a comparison of means. You're not allowed more than one mean value greater than 85% dissolved for either of the products. Um, the coefficient of variance should not be more than 20% at early time points, and early time points are classified as up to 10 minutes in this guidance, and not more than 10% at other time points. Uh, in order to be considered similar, the two profiles have to have an F2 greater than or equal to 50. However, when both products are greater than 85% in 15 minutes, you do not need to do F2. The dissolution profiles are considered similar. One thing that we would have also liked to have seen in the guidance, but it, it isn't there, is that when your coefficient of variance is too high, the F2 calculation is obviously inaccurate because it's a comparison of the means, and you're not allowed to make any conclusion on similarity. So there is no allowance given to use alternative statistical tools such as F2 bootstrapping, Mahalanobis, or two one-sided t-tests. And the rationale for not including any other test is that you're not expected to see high variability for a highly soluble drug substance. And it does state that if your variability that you see is related to coding, then that should be overcome, which brings me back to my previous slide and my previous questions. Uh, for BCS3s, it's very simple. Both should be display very rapid, so they both must be greater than 85% dissolved uh, in less than or equal to 15 minutes. Again, fixed, fixed dose combination should meet the criteria for the, the all drug substances to allow a BCS bioweaver. And again, for products with more than one strength, you need to apply the dissolution, comparative dissolution, to all strengths. So you cannot do any kind of bridging between the low and the high. You have to do all strengths. So if you have five strengths, that means you have to do uh, um, five dissolutions for the test and reference at the three pHs. So you can imagine for that sort of situation, the, the in vitro work package will become very large very quickly. And we're nearly there. So now the last bit, documentation. Um, the Expected information that you're expected to provide it. You need to provide information on what are the critical quality attributes of your test drug substance and product. You need to include as much information as you can gather on the reference product. So things about polymorphic form and antimeric purity. Any information on bioavailability or bioequivalence problems with the drug substance or product. And this can include literature and sponsor derived studies. You need to include all study protocols and report. And you need to include include uh, information on your test methods uh, and and they need to be as detailed as your current regulatory guidance. You need to show tables and graphs of the individual and mean results and any summary statistics. You need to document all your excipients and their qualitative and where appropriate quantitative differences um, for the reasons that Zave stated. You need a full description of the methods which includes the validation and qualification of the me uh, analytical parameters. Um, you need to include um, descriptions of methods, media preparation, test and reference batch information. Uh, for the dissolution, you need to include information on the apparatus, uh, the deaeration methods, any filtration uh, details, the volumes used, etc. 
and you need to provide complete information on your method applied for your CACO2 um, assay if applicable. So yeah, so now to just to conclude and to wrap up, um, there's a little timeline here. Again, I said it took nearly 25 years. You can see the BCS was published by Gordon Amadon back in March 95. The first guidance appeared in 2000 from the FDA, which was then followed up by the EU in 2007, which lead, led to the EU guideline on uh, bioequivalence in 2010, which then led to your ICHM-9 in 2019. So this was quite a long drawn out process, um, but it is important to say that ICHM-9 is very welcome by industry. It's a great stride forward. It um, it's, um, improves. Uh, improves the situation and the, uh, reduces the amount of work that we have to carry out. Um, we need to ensure that global acceptability is achieved, and especially in the situations where we've highlighted that some flexibility or scientific justification will be required. And as industry, we're watching keenly at the minute because we're looking at these countries who are going to implement the guidance. So we, we notice on the 26th of August, Canada implemented their, their guidance, and we're, we're expecting to see that from other territories sh shortly. Uh, and we welcome, in particular, uh, from an industry and innovator perspective like AstraZeneca, we welcome the acknowledgement of the references to pre-approval BCS-based biowaivers rather than fully focused on post-approval changes. Um, um, there are links to the guidances and the links to the Q&A document uh, in the slides here, which you, I'm assuming you would be provided with. And so uh, with that, uh, we will take any questions or, um, and, and we would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.